Hello and welcome to Digital Futures. The person who accepted our invitation is biologist and professor. She has been appointed as scientific advisor of President Barroso in December 2011. Let me welcome Professor Ann Glover. Hello. Hello. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, today we are, uh, we are talking about restoring growth. Uh, what is your own recipe uh, to overcome these issues and especially beyond 2020? So that's a really big question and a really hard mm. question. But I think, uh, yes, Europe, but actually the world has a problem in terms of uh, financial instability at the moment. And I think from my point of view as a scientist, there's an opportunity here because we can look at what sort of future we want, because in a way this financial crisis makes us stop and think, because we can't just carry on like normal. So we're stopping and we're thinking, what sort of world do we want in 2020 or in 2050? And from my point of view, what can science, engineering and technology help do now to prepare that future for us? So in some of the big areas, like uh, energy, for example, then we need to supply energy securely. We need to do it without damaging the planet. So there's an opportunity there for developing new technologies, for harnessing solar energy or harnessing wind or wave or tidal energy. All of these things we can do which can create employment, can allow us to think about the future in a different way. And so being optimistic, I would say that we, we have to deliver that growth through embracing new technology and thinking about the future in a different way. Okay, and what exactly would you do just to, to follow this, this logic? I absolutely agree with you, but I think uh, it is sometimes difficult to find the right way and the consensus, what is the best way, how to sustain the growth and get all people employed. Okay. So as a scientist, again, I, I don't know that I have the answer for that, but what, what we need to do for society, I think, is to get people talking together with economists, with politicians, with social scientists, uh, and with scientists and engineers to, to almost make the decision about, well, what, what future do we want? Um, because we all need to decide what we want and how we get there. It's not, it's not for me as a scientist to say, well, okay. I think this is how you must have your energy supply or I think this is how much you must consume every year. So there needs to be an interesting, for, for me, an interesting conversation had in terms of, um, let, let's ask a question, what can science do? Science can describe in a way what's possible and what's happening. Science can reduce uncertainty around things like climate change. What impact will that have on, on our planet and on the citizens of the planet? And then science can also offer solutions, but it's up to people to decide what solutions are, are possible. And, and if I can say one more thing, as a, as a scientist, but probably more importantly as a biologist. For me, the idea of continual growth is a very challenging one. And um, I know that when we hear people talk about economies, they talk all the time about we must grow, we must always grow. But in the world of biology, it is not possible to always grow when resources are limited. So if it were possible to keep growing, the simplest bacterium, little bug that lives on the planet, well, the whole planet would be covered with them. It's not because the resources are limited. So for us, uh, as citizens on the planet, our resources are also limited. So we need to think about new economies, new ways of living on the planet to cope with a lot of people, N nine, 9 billion people perhaps by 2050, 7 billion people now, all wanting energy, water, food, other resources uh, as well. So 
I, I can't answer the question of how do you deliver it, but I can say that we need the conversation uh, between citizens, politicians, economists, social scientists and scientists. That's, that's never been more needed to be able to come up with the solutions that will provide us with a future. Uh, we were talking about uh, resource limits. Uh, what do you think that how it will affect our personal lives? Yeah. I think the first thing that we need to do is we need to recognize that there are limited resources. The, we live on a, actually a beautiful planet, but it's a finite planet. So something that we need to remember is that in Europe, for example, the average citizen in Europe requires the resources of three planets for our current lifestyle. Okay, so we're living way beyond the means of the planet. Uh, for North America, people currently require five planets for their resources. It's, it, really it, good. it's well, it, yeah. it's actually shocking. So at the moment, we're we're almost behaving as if everything is unlimited and infinite. We will always be able to use whatever we want. That's not the case. So then what do we do as individual citizens? I think the first thing I think we should do is that we should really value uh, natural resources. So wa water, for example, water is very precious because we absolutely require it for life. So how do, uh, and perhaps in many places in Europe, we take clean water uh, as an absolute, um, but, but take it for granted. Uh, we think it's not valuable, so we waste water and uh, we use clean drinking water for very strange things. For example, like washing windows. Uh, and I think in 2050, we will look back to 2012 and we will think it is madness that we use clean drinking water just to wash our windows. So what's the alternative? The alternative is that we consider nanotechnology, for example, which can provide us with smart coatings on the surface of windows. So that instead of using clean drinking water to clean the windows, we use rainwater to clean the windows. Uh, so two very good things there. Yeah. One is for me, life is too short to spend time cleaning windows. <laughs> yeah. So that's a good news. The, the second thing is that, <clears throat> excuse me, it takes a lot of energy to purify water and it's a very precious resource. So we should never waste it just for cleaning something like windows. So I give that as an example of how we need to think differently and we need to embrace technology. Um, waste, for example, again, the average European citizen buys food, puts it in their refrigerator or what takes it home, but they end up throwing away about 30% of it. Uh, this, this is not sustainable. So we have to think about how we use carefully everything that we buy. And we also think, need to think about raw materials and natural resources. So, um, I was telling someone the other day when I was a student, so quite a few years ago, my entire wardrobe of clothes existed, was two pairs of jeans and three t-shirts. But I lived very happily with two pairs of jeans and three t-shirts. And now I'm embarrassed to say, I probably have 20 t-shirts. That's too much actually. So the clever thing is how to think about giving everybody enough. And people need just enough, but we don't need so many things. But if we reduce consumption, how do we employ people? How do we make sure economies still work? So again, I, I come back to the conversation we need between economists, scientists, citizens about how we can deliver.